guys and welcome to podcast number 13 which is titled the higher functions and introduction uh, and it's the 9th of June so quick turn around on that last video I made I've timed today so I'm down at the Botanical Gardens which is just down the road from my home beautiful place at this time of the morning even if it is still a bit chilly here I want it all popular and tall with looks and never quit and possibly a hit I want the universe to take away the curse to feed me one more lie that I will never die Cause if I had it all then I would never fall as long as I'm alive Shame on me Shame podcasts in this series on the Partsufim. So I'll, we want to give a bit of an explanation before I start discussing the Partsufim themselves of the relationship between the higher and the lower functions. So anyone who's been following the podcast up until this point should already be aware that the there are in the Partsufim scheme of Kabbalah there are three lower functions the Nakash and the Ruach and the Nefesh and the Nakash is the governing principle of the lower functions in the lower sphere these three aspects of the human psyche make up everything about you which you are aware of about yourself. They are the parts of you that view, sense and think about the outer world. They are your ability to reason and your ab ability to emote or feel. They are the storage of all of your memory from the present life that you're living. Everything that you are capable of doing in the way of reasoning is encompassed in your lower functions. Everything you believe about the world, how it functions, what it is, uh, your moral, your personal moral code and ethical code, your ability to uh, function as a reasonable being. The degree of maturity of your ability to function as a um, living uh, incarnate individual all of these things are encompassed 
in your lower functions. Everything that you can know about yourself as an incarnate person, everything you believe, everything you're aware of about who you are and what you are capable of is encompassed in the bounds of the lower functions. It happens very rarely in a lifetime where the average person gets a glimpse at what the higher functions are, that part of us that operates behind the scenes in the unconscious mind. Most people, even when they get a tiny glimpse because of some accident or some unusual situation that happens in their life, anyone who actually gets a tiny glimpse at, at the higher functions is unlikely to recognize or understand what it is that has just happened to them. They are probably write it off as some kind of religious or spiritual experience and leave it at that and probably never discuss it with anyone else or if they do they would probably only discuss it with people who they trust who are very close to them. But their chances are they have no idea of what it is that they just experienced. With a few exceptions, people who have terminal illness or who have experienced terminal illness or through some trauma come close to the end of their life or actually die and are revived will often have an experience of their higher functions and they understand that in some way that experience has to do with either the spiritual part of themselves or more likely they will just uh, relegate it to the realm of something religious or spiritual outside of themselves such as um, a, a, an experience of God or something like that. The reality of the matter is human beings, the small insignificant creatures that we are, do not experience God directly. So whenever you hear anybody say um, I had a near-death experience or whatever and God came to me, or whatever, that, ain't, that isn't God. That is some aspect of that individual's higher functions. And when they are having an experience of that part of themselves, the only thing that they know to relate it to that is part of their average everyday experience is uh, a religious experience or the idea that um, somehow it is God or some kind of overarching... Uh, 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 spiritual experience. What it actually is, it's your lower functions beginning to shut down <coughs> and a bridge opening up between your lower functions and your higher functions. When you hear people say, I had an experience of God or I had an spiritual experience, what that person is explaining to you is um, the actual nature of the higher functions. So for the average person who doesn't understand what this should be or how it works, um, this kind of experience that people describe is a, a good explanation of what is going on in the higher part of yourself, not something outside of you, not something that is at the end of the universe peering down on its own creation, but it is a part of yourself which is so advanced and separated from you that uh, all your lower functions can do when they find themselves experiencing that part of you is to relegate that experience to the realm of religion or God or something like that. Okay, so lower functions. They are everything that is you. Everything you can be aware of about yourself as a normal person human being and I say as a normal human being because it actually is possible for you to experience your higher functions uh, deliberately but you have to alter your human nature you have to change what is normally you and become something which is more than normally you
in order to deliberately access your uh, an experience of your higher functions. Um, so when I say in the average person, this is how things are, that the average person virtually never has any experience of his or her higher functions. And even when they do, they don't really know what it is that's going on with them. Um, when I say in the average person, I also include in that estimation occultists in the mainstream. That means virtually everybody who considers themselves an occultist, right up to those who consider themselves serious occultists. Even those individuals who often like to believe that they're having interactions with their higher functions, communication with their higher self, virtually never are. And if it ever happens, the chances are, just like the average person on the street, they will relegate that experience to the realm of something outside of them. It was God or it was an angel. And they're thinking when they do that, that those entities or those intelligences are something outside of themselves, simply because the average person, the average occultist, even the most serious of occultists, largely, when they experience the higher functions, they find it very difficult to accept that inside of themselves, something that extreme and powerful and uh, awesome exists at the core of their being. So, uh, of course, when they're having these experiences, they're thinking about them and emoting about them with their lower functions. And their lower functions uh, don't, first of all, the lower functions don't like to believe that there might be something within that person, within yourself, that is that powerful and that extreme. So it is natural for the lower functions to deny ownership of the higher functions, even though that's the wrong word, because the lower functions don't own the higher functions, but the higher functions are part of the complete unit which is you as an individual living intelligence. So it's important, first of all, to understand this concept. The lower functions do not want to recognize the higher functions. Even if you're sitting around telling yourself as somebody who um, studies esoteric knowledge that you believe in the soul and the spirit and you believe in reincarnation and you believe in your higher self and you believe that you're talking or having some kind of communication with your higher self. The fact of the matter is extensive research proves that when pressed to make serious changes, serious self-development changes, towards spiritual emancipation, the Ruach and the Nefesh and the Nakash will not accept the existence of the higher functions. They will certainly not accept the concept that there is a hidden part of you that is like deep inside of your mind which is actually governing your entire existence. Your lower functions doesn't want to accept that. Even to the degree that when the lower functions are forced to experience firsthand the existence of the higher functions, your lower functions will still deny their existence, or even if they accept the existence, they will still fight against the idea and the reality of the higher functions governing who you are as an individual person. This is important. Anybody who is fooling themselves into believing that the Ruach and the Nefesh are going to be happy to play the game of occult training, self-development, spiritual initiation, spiritual emancipation, anybody who fools themselves into believing that the Ruach and the Nefesh want to play that game is in a complete state of delusion because they do not want to play the game but part of their game plan 
is to hide that fact from you. They don't want you thinking that they are going to resist your spiritual emancipation because if you actually catch on to the fact that your lower functions are resisting your spiritual emancipation, the chances are then you will start making plans to combat that resistance. As long as you do not know that that resistance exists, then you're not going to fight against it. That is a really important thing to understand. As long as you as a sentient being are not aware that your lower functions deeply want to resist your spiritual emancipation and, and that they resist a belief or an acceptance in a belief that your higher functions actually govern your entire reality once you understand that this is the state of the game then the chances are you'll fight against that resistance and the last thing Nefesh and Ruach and Nakash want you to do is to start formulating plans for fighting back so that you can develop yourself so that you can uh, work on your spiritual emancipation it's important to get all that firmly entrenched in your head all of what I have just said is easily provable every student that we have trained over the last 25 or 30 years um, in a process which definitely has been repeatedly proved to be able to take people into knowledge and conversation with their higher genius our process works it works we know how it works we know why it works and we can make it work on anybody who is capable of following instructions properly. So the things that I'm saying here are not guesswork or simple theories. They are knowledge based on repeatedly reliable experience. No matter what you believe, your lower functions do not want you to succeed in your spiritual development. Virtually every student that we take on um, comes to us, of course, believing that they're the chosen one, that their entire life has pointed towards success in initiation, that this is all they've ever really wanted, etc., etc., etc. They're absolutely convinced that the part of themselves and their life that they are thinking about themselves in their life with, and that is their Ruach, and to a certain degree the Nefesh and the Nakash, they believe that those parts of themselves are smart enough to know whether or not they are capable of succeeding and that they want to succeed. It never occurs to them that there is a subterfuge going on and that the very thing that they are thinking about their spiritual progress with, which is their Ruach, is actually the cause of the problem. Okay, so then there's the higher functions. So I'm only going to talk about them as a collective right here because the next series of podcasts are where we're going to talk about each one of the higher functions specifically, what they are, what their functions are, uh, their condition inside of you and all that kind of thing. So the lower functions belong to temporal reality. And temporal, temporal reality means the changing world. There's only one reliable rule about life at that level and that is that change always happens and this is one of the primary rules that govern the lower functions they are limited in their lifespan they have a creation point and a uh, decomposition point and they evolve between those two um, points on the scale in other words while you're alive even if you don't think you are, you are developing from birth to death and their view of reality is limited. By their very nature, everything about the Ruach, the Nefesh and the Nakash is limited. They have a limited view of what reality is. That's their nature. Now, everything about the higher functions is at the opposite end of the scale to the lower functions. The higher functions are the eternal part of you. 
they exist from lifetime to lifetime, incarnation to incarnation, and they accumulate all of the experiences that you have in each of your lives, and they and that accumulation of experience is calculated and summed up in the being of your higher self and that database of experience and knowledge becomes the wisdom of the ages inside of you so your higher functions if you consider what just what I've just said there that they are existing in the background behind each one of the lives you have ever lived accumulating the experiences and the lessons of every single lifetime and that you have possibly lived hundreds or thousands or even millions of lifetimes and therefore your higher functions have accumulated a database of experience and lessons learned from hundreds or thousands or, or millions of lifetimes then you can get some idea you can begin to get some idea about the the level of intelligence the the understanding and the wisdom that the higher functions have access to so let's take a small example of a standard experience from a lifetime lived and let's look at the concept of marriage because marriage ha exists in virtually every culture and it's existed virtually all the way through human history so um, if we have lived say 500 lifetimes let's make a rough guess and say out of those 500 lifetimes we could possibly have had 400 marriages lasting for various lengths of time of course the further back we go in history the longer marriages lasted for the vast portion of human existence marriages lasted a lifetime so imagine all of the um, experiences that happen inside a marriage arguments learning to understand what the other person is all about learning to understand all about the other gender how they function giving birth to children helping children to grow up and watching them develop into adults and then watching them get married and have their own children if you have done all of those things so let's say four or five hundred times you're going to become an expert in marriage if you could access in gross detail all of the information that you've accumulated about the custom and culture of being married now add to that that's just one sliver of a of experiences that can happen in a single incarnation now add to that all of the other common experiences that most people in most cultures have in their life things like hunting and gathering preparing and eating food being unwell and healing traveling by various means on foot or in vehicles domesticating animals being involved in education of different kinds education and hunting education in relationships education in preparing food esoteric training lining up all those different slivers of experience of human experience then multiplying them by 
500 times. 500 lifetimes of being involved in those kinds of experiences. And then throwing all of that information from all of those slivers of experience into a storage space, a data bank, in the higher functions, in which the higher functions can access, relive, remember, and learn from all of those experiences at once, at any time. That means, that creates, that gives a rise to a form of intelligence which is extremely wise and curiously enough when we experience the higher functions firsthand one of the things that we discover about the character of the higher functions or let's kind of say the personality of the higher functions is that after the higher functions have had access to all of those ages of detailed, minute, repeated experiences, the character of the higher functions is totally benevolent, totally benevolent. And their personality, the higher functions personality, is one of complete and unconditional love. That's the conclusion that the higher functions have come to from everything that they have learned from being incarnate hundreds, thousands, or millions of times. That's important. So the higher functions are eternal relative to our reckoning of time or infinity. The higher functions are eternal. They don't shut down. They don't go to sleep. They don't die. They continue to exist and accumulate experience and the lessons of life. The higher functions are also unconscious in us. In other words, the lower functions are not conscious at all that the higher functions exist. And when the lower functions become aware of some faculty or experience of the higher functions, by habit, from their nature of how they view the world, they look at the higher functions as being something external to themselves, like an environment or a piece of an environment or something that is moving in another environment outside of themselves. At the same time, the higher functions are responsible for everything, everything that you recognize as your life in the lower functions. Your environment, the people you interact with, the way you see those people and the way you see your environment, your ability to reason, your ability to wake up in the morning and see the sun rising, your ability to feel empathy with a child that you've given birth to, your ability to educate and raise that child, um, the kinds of experiences you find yourself involved in in life, whether you become a soldier or a teacher or a chef or a mother or a father, all of these things right down to the very atoms of your body are being created and maintained by your higher functions. Your higher functions govern everything about your reality. There is a little bit of exception to that rule, but I don't want to touch on that yet because that's another subject for another podcast. For all intents and purposes, as an average, everyday, incarnate living human being, Everything that you are aware of and know about, everything that you can potentially know about your everyday life is created, maintained and governed by your higher functions. This is the case so that that wise part of yourself that has accumulated all of that knowledge and wisdom and reaps the benefits of all those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lessons 
is the one that's running your life, not you. Not you, the dumbass, who thinks they know everything about life and is running around buying cell phones, talking rubbish on Facebook and screwing up their employment opportunities. It is far more productive, far more productive for your higher functions to be running your life. And all of that governing process, all of that creating and maintaining and governing that your higher functions do is happening behind the scenes, from behind the scenes, in your unconscious mind, not your subconscious mind. It's a Hollywood word and it uh, has nothing to do with um, the accurate discussion of human psychology. Um, you only become conscious of what's going on behind there if either a trauma happens in your life and the veil which separates your conscious mind from your unconscious is rendered and you get to peep behind the screen or if you enter training which is deliberately designed to carefully and surgically part that veil so that you can peer behind the screen or under certain conditions when you're involved in what we'll call mainstream esoteric training but an untrained person a person who has not been influenced by an expert in rending that veil between the conscious and the unconscious mind an untrained person who manages to rend that veil 99.999 percent of the time will not understand what they have experienced they will interpret it in the wrong way because the reality that's going on in the unconscious mind the clockwork mechanism behind the clock face is such an unusual completely unusual reality that when you look at it you have no idea what you're looking at and no reference frame for understanding what it is that you're looking at and what what you're looking at means so this is why uh, in order to properly self-develop in a spiritual way in order to properly attain spiritual emancipation a proper effective training system has to be entered into and that training has to be delivered by somebody who is an expert somebody who is already in the position where they have crossed between the conscious and the unconscious mind and by experience they know what the clockwork is all about how it functions and how to deal with it productively in order not to break the clock so this is where the process of initiation comes in the ancient tradition of esoteric or hermetic initiation it is an institution which exists in the realm of humanity and has existed for at least thousands of years and has been passed down reliably from one expert to his pupils and then from them to their pupils for thousands of years in an unbroken tradition. That statement is often debated and uh, often uh, denied by a lot of people in the esoteric community, but I can absolutely assure you that it is an accurate statement, it is an accurate situation. So, in order to cross from the lower functions into the higher functions, in order to create a link or a bridge between those two functions, a very specific kind of education is required, which involves learning the theory behind that, crossing over, and being involved in a form of practice which can 
actually affect that crossing over and then a training about what to do once you find yourself on the other side of that situation. So in talking about creating that link, building that bridge between the higher and lower functions, we also need to understand that um, a boundary exists between the lower functions and the higher functions, which in Kabbalah is known as the abyss. And they call it the abyss because any attempt at trying to cross that boundary is virtually impossible without specialized knowledge. That's why they call it a bush, an abyss. They don't simply call it a wall or a boundary or a division between the lower and the higher functions. They call it an abyss because any attempt at consciously and deliberately trying to um, cross that boundary is virtually impossible without specialized knowledge. So the Kabbalists place, we know that there are 10 spheres on the tree of life, the Kabbalistic tree of life, on the standard tree of life. The Kabbalists deliberately placed an 11th sphere in the abyss, and they called that sphere in Hebrew, Darth. And Darth translates directly into English as knowledge. And that word knowledge or Darth does not refer simply to learning anything an accumulation of knowledge in a lifetime. It refers to esoteric knowledge. Darth refers to a specialized esoteric training. When you get that training and you put it into practice, then you are in a position to cross from the lower functions to the higher functions productively and effectively. So with all of this understanding, grasping everything I've said up until this point. Why would anybody want to cross the abyss between the lower functions and the higher functions? What's the point? Why did the ancients set up these esoteric schools and institutions, lines, lineages or streams of training, specialized esoteric training, in order to help human beings cross from the lower functions into the higher functions? So there are two reasons for that. The first reason is we are all eventually going to develop the ability to cross the abyss naturally anyway, hundreds or thousands of years in our future at some point, even possibly millions. It might not happen for millions of years because that's how difficult it is to simply wait for evolution to make such a jump. It is easier to develop a fish and then evolve a ruach which so far has taken the human race at least 50,000 years or more just to develop a Ruach. Um, it is easier to do those things by far than it is to establish a condition in the human mind and behavior that allows us to cross the abyss in consciously into the higher functions. So, we're all so the first thing is we're all gonna develop that ability sooner or later anyway. The second reason the second answer to this question, the second reason for doing this is that it is quicker for humanity to achieve the goal of being able to develop the higher functions as a normal part of the mind. If some people go ahead of the rest of the human race and uh, make pathways into the unknown, that forward guard or those um, expert scouts lay the foundations and the um, methods by which the rest of humanity follow. Whether we like it or not, that situation exists. Uh, those people exist and they are working a way in humanity to change our beliefs, our behaviors, our level of conscience, our society, in order to make our society a place where spiritual emancipation is not only an accepted part of human experience, but in order to establish institutions which make it possible to deliberately work towards spiritual emancipation. 
until these things are made acceptable and um, proper working methods are, made, are accessible by the average person, spiritual emancipation is not going to happen on any kind of large scale. It is only going to happen to a small number of people who are the forward guard, the pathfinders for humanity who are carving their way into the wilderness of the higher functions. So that's the second reason why for wanting to do this. This isn't uh, a process which is open to everybody and it's not something that everybody actually wants to do even if they believe they want to do it. Because it's not an easy thing to advance human evolution from a state of virtual barbarianism into um, making the higher functions with everything that they are a normal functioning part of your daily conscious experience. So this is the reason for maintaining the ancient traditions of esoteric training and uh, those methods and purposes are aimed specifically at building that bridge between the lower and the higher functions. What this means at the same time is the processes, the systems and institutions which have been established to aid humanity in advancing themselves enough to become spiritually emancipated, all of these things actually came down from the higher functions in the first place. At some point in human history, somehow, human beings who are capable of grasping the nature of this entire subject and then of doing something productive about advancing themselves gained that knowledge, that inspiration and the ability to succeed in that advance evolution personally they gained all that from the higher functions. So what this means is that, for example, alchemy as a body of knowledge and practice, as an institution of education, and magic as a body of knowledge and practice, and as an institution of esoteric training, are bodies of knowledge which naturally reside in the higher functions and precipitate down into the lower functions. In order to be able to learn magic and alchemy properly, in order to be able to understand what these two things are, and then in order to be able to practice them effectively with powerful results, a human being must form that bridge between the lower and the higher functions. You have to get your head, your mind, your ability to think into the higher functions and think with the higher functions, to put it crudely, in order to be able to properly understand the nature of esoteric knowledge and training. So all of these occultists in the mainstream who are really just average people playing around with pseudo-occultism, they're trying to learn all that stuff by using primarily their Ruach and partially their Nefesh. They're trying to use the lower functions in order to understand knowledge which is stored in the higher functions and comes from the higher functions. Now remember what I said at the beginning of this podcast, the lower functions do not like the idea of the higher functions and they resist anything to do with the higher functions. Therefore trying to use your lower functions to study and master something which belongs to the higher functions simply does not work. This is why self-initiation, attempting to train yourself in this kind of knowledge, doesn't work. It doesn't work. Remember also what I said about the lower functions not wanting you to know 
that they are resisting. If you really understood that your lower functions resisted your spiritual emancipation and did not want to believe in or have anything to do with your higher functions, if you had a true desire for spiritual emancipation, the first thing you're going to do is find an effective way of combating that resistance and that denial. The easiest way for Ruach, Nefesh and Nakash to stop you from taking that step is first of all to make you think that they are playing the game. That they want to study occult knowledge. Look, I'm buying all these cool books, I'm reading them and rereading them and I'm really understanding them and I'm now a member of the Golden Dawn or BOTA or whatever and I'm studying all these correspondence courses which are written by powerful individuals who know what the game is about and I and I'm doing ritual and I'm having these really cool spiritual experiences it's all a subterfuge none of that stuff I've never seen a single incidence from a rank-and-file member of any esoteric organization or school I've never seen a single incidence of just your average occultist who is studying alone I've never seen a single incidence from somebody who is an authority in one of these schools or institutions where they actually have developed themselves spiritually in an effective way and are having a real, meaningful and productive communication with their higher functions. I've never seen it. And one of the curious things about New Zealand is, even though we're geographically very isolated here, we've had a number of esoteric institutions moved here from the Americas and from Europe, from the old world, or from the Northern Hemisphere, the new world in the Northern Hemisphere, to New Zealand, um, because people are hoping that bringing those things here is going to preserve them, or at least help preserve them. So I've easily come into contact here because we have such a small population with people in positions of authority in large, well-respected esoteric institutions. And none of those people have any proper understanding of what real esoteric training is. And I've never met one who could have a discussion with me on the subjects which I've produced in this just in this podcast alone. I've never met another individual who is capable of talking about Kabbalah, human psychology and initiation at this level. And this isn't even serious, man. This is just common level, basic, fundamental understanding on which to start building a proper um, esoteric self-development. Your lower functions lie to you. They want you to believe that they are keen and really uh, productive in the realm of esoteric study, but they do not want you to know that they are deliberately messing with your perception in order to stop you from accessing the knowledge that really works and from doing the practices which really evolve an individual. They'll let you go right to the edge of knowledge of real knowledge and right to the edge of real practical experience but they are so cunning that they can tweak an entire area of study or activity just to pluck out the little bits which are the keys to making things work and what they leave behind what you're doing in your practice and study is what looks like a very authentic situation but you have no idea because you simply don't understand you're not in a position to understand that the tiny little essential keys in those systems are missing that's the difference between the average person who studies esoteric knowledge and an adept an adept knows what the keys are and knows when they are missing or being resisted and knows how to stop all that stuff from happening so that you can then succeed. So it's not like mainstream esoteric study is, has no value, it actually does because a big chunk of it actually is the body of the real functioning system. It's just that it's missing the essential points. Plus conventional mainstream education also includes things which stop 
those systems from being effective. People who are psychotic and counterproductive, who are running those institutions, for example, and, and are doing everything they can to make sure that nobody is really succeeding. Things like that. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up podcast number 13, an introduction to the higher functions. What I wanted to do is just help everybody understand the basic nature of the lower functions as a group of three things and uh, make everybody aware that the higher functions are eternal and that they have all that wisdom of the ages stored in them and that there is an abyss between the higher and lower functions and that there is an age-old system designed for crossing that abyss. So the next thing in discussion of the higher functions that we're going to talk about is what the higher functions actually are. What kind of things do they do in our life? They're operating behind the scene. We can actually see their effects in the symptoms of their governing process. There are things that we can recognize in our world about what it is that our higher functions are doing in our reality and the more that we recognize those things the more that we become aware of our higher functions what they're actually doing and how they're seeping through the network of reality in order to affect our lives so that's the next step to talk a bit in detail about the higher functions and then um, when I get on to the series that I discussed in the previous podcast about what initiation is all that is going to revolve around what's required to cross that abyss between the higher and lower functions, what initiation really involves. So, if you got to this point of this podcast, thanks very much for watching again, and I hope to see you in podcast number 14, which will be entitled something like Nishama. I want it all Popular and tall With looks and never quit And possibly a hit I want the universe To take away the curse to feed me one more lie that I will never die Cause if I had it all then I would never fall as long as I'm alive Shame on me Shame If I had it all